Newton's first law. So in this particular law, when you are just beginning and trying to understand it, um, when you read the law itself, now it could be worded a little bit differently than how I have worded it here, which states an object at rest or moving at a constant velocity will continue to stay at rest or move with the same constant velocity unless acted on by a net external force. When you read that for the first time and you're introduced to physics, you, um, well, like myself at that time, you may not really know what this means. Um, you know, what, what exactly is rest, you know, moving at constant velocity, you know, we should know that um, because if we studied kinematics, you know, we should have a concept of constant velocity. Um, at rest means uh, basically, you know, velocity is zero. So, you know, we have two really cases, velocity equals to zero and velocity is some constant. So it's not necessarily zero, but it is constant and it's moving in the same direction. So let's try to break this down. Now, before I try to break it down, so this uh, Newton's first law, sometimes it's actually also referred to as the, you know, law of inertia. Now, well, so there's another term, you know, inertia, and what the heck does that mean? Um, and it's not always the easiest thing. I think it took me quite a long time, you know, to really come to terms with it. And I was thinking, you know, how would I introduce that to you? Because you should, you know, hear that word inertia, and you should have some concept, okay, with regards to it. So, you know, if you're thinking, before I start going into this and breaking down the law, if you're thinking of inertia itself, um, you know, you can think of it kind of in several, you know, small little things. So the first thing is ultimately everything to do in dynamics and with these forces has something to do with motion, right? So, you know, what will cause motion, what will prevent motion, right, in some way, okay? And now for inertia itself, okay, as you're going through this, the ultimate thing is um, inertia is like a resistance. So it almost seems like it's almost like a force in some way or some internal, okay, so internal component of an object that will resist motion. So it is resistance to motion. And how much of that resistance it has will depend on numerous features. Now, one of the you know, major features, which is more easy to understand for students starting off is that you know, the bigger an object is, when I say bigger, you know, I'm talking about its mass, you know, so how much matter. So if you have a very small object, it might be you know, much easier for us to be able to move it. So that object might have very little inertia. If you have a very big object or a heavy object, right, with a lot of mass, it will be much harder for us to move it. Now, there are other features that might restrict, okay, or prevent or resist the actual motion itself, right? So kind of the shape of the object that you might have. But if you're removing all of the kind of, um, you know, frictions, okay, all the way throughout, Initially, I would want you as a student to think of inertia almost analogously to, so, um, to, to actual mass. That's almost kind of the same exact thing. And sometimes mass is defined, in fact, in terms of inertia so that you, you, know, you will have that okay, as well. And it's a great definition. So you know, in small little detail, inertia is the resistance to motion, right? So it is that. Now, it is also, you know, the resistance of changing motion. So if you want to be able to change motion, because keep in mind, if you are moving at a certain velocity, right, and you want to stop it, right, so you want to stop it in some way or slow it down, you're going to have to apply, well, it's going to be application of some forces or some forces have to be applied. And in order to stop this object, Okay, or slow it down, okay, you're trying to overcome, you know, so it has this inertia, right, this presence, okay, of continuing on its path, okay, the way it is, unless you, you know, you put force. And again, if you think of mass, if you have a much bigger object and it's moving like a car, 
right? It's very difficult to try to stop that car. You know, like if you have something else, you, you know, you, you try to prevent it, it'll be very difficult for you to do that. It's because the car itself, because it's the amount of mass that it has, has a lot, okay, of inertia. Okay, so that inertia is rather big. So it's difficult to try to, you know, now prevent, okay, and slow down. That's all, in my viewpoint, still all resistance to motion, right? Now the motion is now actually, instead of it moving at a speed, you want to slow it down. So now you're resisting the actual positive motion and you want to, you want to try to slow it down in some way. If you have an object which is very small, then what happens is that that object's much easier for us to be able to slow down or change its motion. So again, you know, you can think of that inertia as that component. So whenever someone mentions the word inertia, you know, think about motion and, you know, how hard is it to try to speed something up? How hard is it to actually <clears throat> change its motion in any way? So possibly slow it down, right? Or maybe even change its direction, you know, even if you wanted to change and something is even standing still and you want to just change, okay, its actual orientation. Well, <clears throat> if it has a lot of inertia, it's going to be difficult for you to do that. You know, if it's a little pebble, okay, well, then it might be much easier because that has a little inertia. So I hope that gives you some sense, okay, in terms of this concept of inertia. And you can tie it into motion, okay, and then it's resistance to change of motion. So that's probably, okay, one of the better ways instead of just saying to motion, okay, I'm going to replace this. And here, put in to summarize all of this, to change Okay, resistance to changing motion. So changing motion would be kind of the ideal way of thinking about this. And again, you can tie it into mass and then it'll be easier for you to understand, okay, in that way. So coming back to this, um, Newton's first law, which is all about inertia, okay? So, um, and what it states is, so there's two kind of components. So the one at rest, okay, so if having an object at rest is rather simple to be able to think about. It's something that we actually intuitively can understand. It's the constant velocity that we have a very big problem with in terms of understanding until you do understand forces much better. So let's tackle rest first. Now, what does rest actually mean? Well, you know, if you take any object, you know, rest will mean that we are having uh, some kind of a velocity and that velocity is zero. Now the units will drop and so on. So that means it's not moving at all. Um, and it will just stay there at rest, meaning that it's not going to move at all unless you kind of exert an external force. Now, what does that mean in external net force? Well, you know, so external net forces, if you have an object um, and if you were starting to talk about net forces, for example, so we oftentimes drop the external and we're just simply will say net forces. We typically mean exactly the same thing. Um, well, that goes back to, okay, understanding the component that, you know, your net force, your external net force is the summation, okay, of all of the forces that are actually applied on the object itself, right? So here is the definition and I can put up a link up above there. You know, my assumption is that you know what net force kind of in general um, means. So net external force means that if you place an object and you know, you put forces externally to it, meaning internal forces are within an object, right? So there's obviously a lot of internal forces, you know, that you have that is keeping these things together, you know, if it's an object like a solid, right? So there's forces that are keeping these things together. But what we mean as an external force is, you know, like if you have an object and you literally kind of push that object, pull that object, or if you have friction, or if you have gravity, those are acting on the external components. And when you add them up, then what happens is, Okay, one of two things, you can add up all of your forces and you know, it can be either zero or it can be not zero. So it's one or the other. Now, if it's zero, right, then it continues to stay at rest, meaning that all of the forces kind of cancel each other off. And when you add them together, well, it's just zero. So your net external force or just net force is zero. And therefore the object won't do anything right? It will just stay at rest, assuming that it started from rest. Now, if it's not equal to zero, um, then 
it actually will no longer okay continue to be at rest right so the first component is of first newton's law is that if you have something which is moving or not moving at all so if the velocity is zero and you take a look at the net external forces and they're zero well then it will just stay exactly doing what it's doing intuitively that should make sense to you if you don't do anything to an object it will just kind of stay there so the next component which is much harder and that component is well now what if you do have motion if you do have motion in some particular way so as you're going through so what you're saying is well that you know this is not equal to zero it is actually something um, but it's constant right so it means it's not changing now if you say constant so if you think back of kinematics this means that the acceleration is zero right so the actual acceleration is zero so that's what constant means so you're not really speeding up slowing down in any way so if you have this, if it is actually constant, um, then what is happening is that you still will have the fact that your external forces, so the summation of forces, is actually zero, right? So that is very difficult for us to understand intuitively. You'd be like, hmm, if it's zero, hold on a second, shouldn't it just you know, not be moving at all anymore? Well, you know, I will give you a very simple example. So, for example, when you do have an object, and let's say that you have this object, okay, and it is, you know, let's say here's my force, okay, and this is the applied force, okay, that I have, maybe the car's engine, and I'm going to really simplify this. Now, don't forget that there is a lot of resistance, okay, as you're going through here. And this, you know, force of resistance or force of friction, both, Okay, in the sense of you know this object or this car being on the ground and then the air resistance itself, I'm grouping it together, right? So I'm calling all of that friction. Okay, so that is the resistance which is trying to prevent okay, the actual motion. So what happens is um, if you would add these two up together, right? So one is notice in the positive direction, so the other one I guess is gonna be in this direction. And what happens is these two as the net force um, they will equal to zero if that happens it doesn't mean that the object is no longer moving no no okay the object is moving but it's moving at a constant speed what's allowing it to move is that you're still applying a force here right you have an applied force from the engine which is overcoming the resistance force it is just equal to it so they're equal to each other so that they cancel each other off and then the object just continues on its way so that's what happens in constant velocity when you have constant velocity it doesn't mean that you're no longer applying any forces there are forces they're just canceling each other out or you're applying a force which basically just counteracts any force that is trying to slow it down in some way so you just continue on your way now if you make this force you know bigger you know if this applied force now starts to be bigger well then your net external force all of a sudden will not be equal to zero anymore because now you have overcome the resistance and now the object can actually change its velocity and if it's changing its velocity it's going to be accelerating in some way so that's what happens so that is newton's first law it doesn't seem very complicated, but I hope that you do understand. This one is rather simple, right? So students do understand this. Okay, if I'm not doing anything, okay, so I guess, you know, you do have a forces and they're canceling out. But don't forget that even at rest, you will have some forces. So if you go back kind of to the, you know, the free body diagrams, you know, you might have a, a, a book which is just sitting on a table and you certainly have gravity acting on this, but you also have the normal force, which is coming from the table, and that normal force, because you're, it's the object's not falling through the table, right, or even me, I'm not falling through the chair right now that I'm sitting on and talking to you. So the chair has a normal force, so basically it's counteracting, now it has a cushion, so I guess it, I'm, you know, I'm squashing it a little bit, but I'm not falling through the chair, so ultimately the gravity right is being counterbalanced i'm at rest I'm not moving i mean i'm moving my mouth and, and so on in terms of talking in this video but 
okay? Uh, in general, you know, I wouldn't necessarily be moving. So the, the, the normal force is counteracting the force of gravity and they cancel each other off, right? And therefore there is no movement at all. I'm just gonna be sitting now. If the chair breaks or something like that or someone takes away the chair, then I'm just gonna fall right to the ground. Okay? And that will be caused because there is a net external force. The force of gravity now will be acting much more, okay? And it will no longer be counterbalanced by the force of the normal, okay? That is causing, so meaning the actual chair is pushing up against me, okay? Um, those are, you know, what's happening inside internally. There are atoms in there, okay, that are balancing off, okay, this force. So that's what you have at rest. And then in motion, you have the same exact thing. You know, in this car, you certainly still had, you know, your force of normal and you had your force of gravity. But in that wide direction, in the up and down, you know, you don't even think about them. You know that they cancel because the car doesn't fall through the ground or, you know, through the earth itself, the surface. So those cancel. But that means that the X components also have canceled. You still might be applying a force, but you're just counteracting all the other forces that are trying to slow this object down. Right, so that's what you have in there, and again, in terms of inertia, well, that's exactly what's happening. So, you know, once you are moving, okay, and you're going at a constant okay, velocity, you know, if you want to be trying to slow this thing down, okay, the object's inertia will come into play, and then how you know, big, how heavy, you know, how much mass it has. Okay, it's going to have a lot of inertia to try to slow it down, and you know that. I mean, if you have a big truck and you have a small car in accidents, well, the inertia of the big, enormous truck, okay, will overtake the smaller car, right? So in those cases, the forces, um, it was much, much harder to slow down that truck than it is, you know, a much smaller car or a bicycle or us walking. So there you have it. That's the introduction to Newton's first law. Um, I hope that it makes, um, you know, a little bit more sense to you. Um, thanks for watching. And welcome to the uh, to the physics uh, to the physics class. Okay, take care. Bye bye.